Good morning, everyone. First of all, I'm not a nurse. I'm not a medical profession, professional. I am a professional medical coach. And what I'd like to do, I'd like to introduce our experience um, using the tool of medical coaching with ALS patients and their family members. So just to begin, what is medical coaching? It's a unique coaching model. It's taken from life coaching, which most of you, I think, uh, have come across. And it's aimed to support patients and their family members coping with the various um, challenges of a medical crisis in various stages of a medical crisis. It can be before we actually have a diagnosis and we're very tense and very nervous, feeling very, very confused. After we have a diagnosis, maybe we're experiencing uh, diagnostic shock and burnout and dealing with the various challenges of life. Medical coaches integrate two things. One is life coaching and the other is emotional therapy because the main difference between medical coaching and life coaching is that when someone comes to a life coach and they want to achieve a goal, they choose the goal, they choose the path, they choose what they want to achieve, they choose their journey. In medical coaching, the, the journey chooses our client and it's a huge difference. Even if they're fully engaged, they did not choose to be sick. So here they are facing this new reality and they need to deal with it, but they did not ask to go on this journey. So we really need to deal with the emotional aspect, the trauma, the loss, the grief, the stress, everything. And the third thing is that medical coaching is goal oriented meaning we set goals. And if we set goals, then we can create accountability and we can measure the process. How close are we to our goal? Is it still the right goal? Do I feel fully, fully committed? Does, do my values, does this goal reflect my values? It's, it's short term, we're talking about a few months. It really depends on our client and it's very, very proactive. Even when we're working with ALS patients, even when um, they're hardly speaking or hardly moving, the dynamics of the session is extremely proactive because our clients are our clients and not our patients, meaning we help them help themselves. And this is very important. So, we set uh, on a bit of a journey with ISRA ALS, which is the Israeli Association. We wanted to check and see whether or not our model can really uh, give added value to the ALS community in Israel. So we set a pilot and we had 21 participants, 13 of them patients, various stages of ALS, and eight family members. We had spouses, we had parents, and we had children. Each uh, client received 12 coaching sessions, free of charge. Uh, about 40% chose to continue after those 12 sessions. So we were very happy about that. I want to give you an example of the various goals that were chosen to work on because we do not coach an illness, we coach a person. So it doesn't matter if that person has cancer, in this case has ALS, we are still coaching a person as a whole. So, example of, co of goals that were uh, chosen by patient. A lot of patients chose to work on the communicational skills with a medical team. How do I communicate my wishes? How do I set boundaries? How do I work along with this medical team that is now is part of my life. And here's the thing, you know, a lot of the times when you have a chronic illness, you don't really choose your doctors and nurses. Maybe, you know, if you weren't ill, you, you wouldn't, you know, have a cup of coffee with them. But now you have to see them regularly and maybe, and you know, and they poke you and they turn you and they do all these intimate things and you just have to come to terms with it and you have to make it work. So, communicational skills. The other thing was healing relationships within the family and with friends because ALS 
is a huge wake-up call. And people realize this. And they get that they don't have a lot of time. This is the time to heal my life. So uh, patients were healing marriages. Um, healing communication uh, relation, and relationship with their children, reconnecting with friends again. So that was another set of goals. The issue of stress management. Being sick is a very stressful way to live. So stress management, stress management in, terms that, in terms of pain, in terms of thoughts, in terms of various things. Because we know that once we are able to reduce the level of stress, uh, a person feels better physically. Now, if you're already dealing with a chronic illness, and a very aggressive one like ALS, and then you have physical symptoms of stress, I mean, that's too much. That's just not fair, is it? So if we can reduce the level of stress, then we actually contribute to the well-being of a person. Not only that, but that's very empowering, because what we teach are tools for people to reduce their own level of stress. So they're not dependent on the, on the medical coach. They can do it by themselves. And within this atmosphere and climate where a patient feels like they're losing control over their bodies and they're losing control over their lives and everything is just one big loss, here they gain tools to create something, to create a certain percentage of well-being within the general context of the illness. Coping with daily challenges. I'm on the, I mean, come on, the daily challenges are huge, are huge. And of course, they connect with issues of self-worth. I mean, if I have a caretaker at home and they need to bathe me and they need to help me in the bathroom, that's not sexy. And if I have a wife and my spouse and my lover has now become my nurse, that doesn't contribute to my self-worth. If I cannot uh, sit at the head of the table with my children and my grandchildren, but I'm in the bed and they're coming and I cannot communicate to them. I mean, you, know, you all know what I'm talking about. So these are a lot of issues that came up. And when I'm talking about daily challenges, they're both the physical, they have to do with, with decision making, okay? They have to do with whether or not, do I, do I want to prolong my life, yes or no, and what are the implications? Um, saying goodbye to food. And, and, you know, and agreeing to, to, the, to the operation of, of inserting a peg. I mean, that's an emotional issue as much as it is a medical issue. So these are part of the challenges. The fact that, you, that a patient feels a burden, the fact that they're so frustrated and they're angry. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit um, uh, in a minute about the goals of family members. And of course, preparing for end of life. So we had, this was also a goal that came up a lot. Some people uh, wish to prolong their life and still get ready. Um, some, of, uh, some of them chose to get ready by preparing their family and, and their community and their friends. And for some people, preparing for the end of their life was dealing with the loss, with the fact that there's a clock ticking and they're running out of time. Goals chosen by family members. First of all, the, 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 just coping with the decline in the patient's uh, uh, condition and abilities. There's a lot of loss here. From day to day, from week to week, the, the reality changes. Balancing the dynamics within the family, okay? Balancing the fact that I might be a wife and hugging my husband and falling asleep next to him at night, and then I have to help him with his, with his, uh, with his illness. Okay, balancing uh, between my role as a caretaker and a mother. You know, if my children need me and, and my spouse needs me, who do I tend to first? Balancing between my own needs as a man, as a woman, and things that I need to do. And of course, there was a lot of stress management here as well, which is the fourth uh, goal. And working, working with hired health, health, uh, caretakers and medical staff, this was a big issue. Because in Israel, you have a hired uh, caretaker, and they come and live within the house, and then you have a total stranger in your very intimate space taking care of someone you love. You have to work with them. Sometimes there is a cultural difference. Sometimes there's a bit of a language barrier. It's a huge thing. 
I would like to give you a few examples, okay? So, just a few words. I would like to talk about G. She came to us and she was a wife of an ALS patient and he was declining very rapidly. And in the midst of all this, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. So she worked with her medical go coach on being able to treat herself because this is something that she kept from the family for a while. So, and uh, it was funny because uh, a while ago there was a meeting and, and she um, named her medical coach of, as one of her major pillars of strength during that time. Her, her husband passed away. We have A, which uh, is over 50, has adult children. He, is, uh, he has three brothers. All of them have ALS, two of them already passed away. And this guy was all about living. He wanted to live until the last minute. He's still alive. So his big dream was to start painting. Using, learning to use a brush with his mouth. And that was the coaching goal. He wanted to create. He wanted to leave art and color in the world to stay after he passes. We have D, which is actually my client. Amazing, amazing man in his 70s. Uh, and he made the courageous decision not to prolong his life. And our coaching is all around that, about uh, having the right to choose until his last breath and still being a father and a leader in his family. So supporting them while choosing this path and still keeping the family together. And we have O. Her mother has ALS in a very progressive state. She was uh, engaged to be married, and her fiance left her. He just couldn't take it anymore because she wasn't attentive enough. Now, O has three siblings and a father. Her father is in deep depression, and the rest of the siblings are young. So she's the new mummy at home. And in the midst of all of that, she wants to become a nurse. So she has to create an emotional space to learn a new profession. She has to deal with the loss of a lover and the potential of marriage. She has to deal with a, with, with a coming loss of her mother and the fact that she knows she's only 24, that once her mother passes, she is the new mother of four children and she needs to support her father, which is in a deep state of depression. So we have been coaching for five months now together and she actually started studying she gathered the strength to start studying, and the other, the other issue was um, making space for other medical professionals and health care takers to come into the family and, and learning to work with them. So that's medical coaching in a bit of a nutshell. Um, I'll be taking questions now because I can speak about this for days. I will be here until the end of the day, and I will say this. Uh, before you, um, medical coaching is not just for coaching, it's for medical professionals and healthcare uh, professionals everywhere. We are opening a course in London in February, so talk to me about that. Yes. Questions? Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. So, questions please, we have one down here first. Hello, I'm Renee from the University of Virginia. Thank Hello, you for Renee. a great presentation. I remember I, you. I have three questions for you. Go for it. <laughs> One is how do you get referrals? We get referrals through uh, insurance companies in Israel. Yay for us, medical coaching is in uh, insurance policies, which was a long uh, pregnancy. We get referrals from NGOs in Israel. We work a lot with NGOs um, through media and through doctors. And then the second question, which you sort of answered, was what is your source of payment? So do you get reimbursed through insurance companies? Uh, we get reimbursed through insurance companies, and, and sometimes and, and the other patients uh, pay themselves. We also, when, here's the thing, okay? Our decision is to change the language of health. This is my vision and my colleague's vision. Evelyn, just wave to everyone. 
So our decision is that medical coaching cannot be an expensive uh, service. So uh, we work with NGOs, we work in different ways to get paid. All right, thank you. And the last question is how much time do you have with each of your patients? Okay, so I have, we meet on a regular, on a weekly base. Usually uh, the client comes to the coach's clinic because that's part of the empowerment. Unless the client is already bedridden and then the coach will come to the client, but then the client has to, um, to be prepared, dressed, bathed, and, all, and, you know, and, and just not in his PJs. Once a week for 50 minutes and the communication between sessions, email, SMSs, and stuff like that, whenever the client needs. Seriously, we're there for them. Thank you, Shiri. Anywhere else? Yep, yeah, over here. Okay. I'm having a hard time understanding exactly methodologically mm. okay. how this happens. I mean, are you giving good advice? Got to be. Uh, I mean, because good advice is often ignored. So what, how do you actually affect this? Okay. Um, Deborah Jelinas is from Grand Rapids. Thank you, Deborah. Okay, here's the thing. First of all, we work with people. Our, our main um, point of view is that our clients are naturally creative, they're naturally resourceful, and they're whole people. They're not broken people. Therefore, they have the agenda. So when I meet a client, the first thing I ask my client is, dear client, what is it that you want? What is missing in your life right now? So we set a goal. Now, since my client is the S expert, I come with a huge uh, toolkit that has to do with coaching skills and NLP and EFT and mindfulness and meditation, you name it, and strategies to work with stress and trauma, okay? And then I said to my client, okay, what is your inner calling? Let's go on a journey, a hero's journey. Okay, what is your calling? And that's the goal. And once we set a goal, we make a plan. Then we have to deal with uh, trauma and obstructions and various emotional demons. And we have to have uh, connect to resources and get allies and work things out. Okay, and there's a goal and there's accountability and we measure it. No, no advice. I don't know what it is to live with ALS. I know what it is to live with another illness, but my client is the expert. So basically, if we were driving towards the goal, my client would be in the passenger's seat and I would be helping them navigate right next to them. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Okay, and in the middle? Ah, sorry, at the back first. Okay, first and then second. Sorry, Nicole Shees from the uh, BRSS at uh, Australia. Um, I think most of us are, uh, it's a new kind of uh, tool or yes. profession for a lot of us here. Um, just with regards, it kind of comes in with the funding question as well. Is this something that you think could be managed through video conferencing? Um, and I ask that specifically as you know, we are a, our our service provides for the state of Victoria, uh, for the, the size the state of Italy. Do you see that this is something that has to be performed one on one, or can we take advantage of some of the modern tools that are coming out? You can definitely use the internet. I would recommend using software with, uh, with uh, an option for camera because that really helps create more rapport. So use Skype, use Uvu, use uh, video conference. You know, uh, my, my clients know that unless they're in the hospital, I, would, I, I prefer that they not cancel a meeting. So for instance, if they have a cold, if I have a cold, whatever, it's raining, there's a storm, we do it uh, using Skype. But it's, uh, it's um, we, we, try to, we really try to avoid canceling sessions. And the question at the front? Uh, Penny Waterson from Remote and Neuron Disease Association of New South Wales. I'm just actually wondering who the client actually is. Is it the person with ALS or the carer or the daughter caregiver? And how would you manage having multiple people in the family who all might have different goals? Oh, perfect question. Thank you. Um, the client is the person that feels they need coaching. It can be the patient and it can be a family member. Okay. Um, in most cases, we have more than one client in the family. Um, and each person in the family will receive a different coach. 
a coach. So that is the slice of heaven, sorry. That is the intimate space. We don't do family therapy, okay? We do individual coaching. So we do have families where we have two or three members, each of them with a different coach. Okay, don't answer your question. Okay, great, thank you. And a final question anywhere? Okay, at the front. So sorry, I hope I'm not as asking too many. I'm, I'm just thinking not through just thing. what, what you said, and then perhaps it's not so much a question, is that what you're doing is empowering people. And when people feel empowered, particularly with an illness, when they've got an illness, if you, you feel, start to feel better about yes. yourself. When you're in control, when you've got an illness which has actually taken your control away, but you feel control about something in your life, you will feel better. True. So that's one of my things, and I'm just trying to remember about coaching my sister, who had myeloma, going to see her professor. Um, and her professor was really very, very difficult, and he didn't listen, um, and he didn't look up, um, and he didn't really talk to her. So we, we actually had a go that by the end of my sister's life, you know, she would be the, one of his most important patients. But the first go will was to make him smile. So I remember going to see her with him and we thought, how are we going to make him smile? And he did actually smile, just by us smiling. So it was, it was, it was a game, <laughs> but it kept her going. Thank you for Thank sharing you. that. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, thank Shiri for that presentation. As she said, Thank she you for listening. Today. So.